Hey everybody, thanks for joining me today. I'm so excited as always, but today in particular, I have Pat Maddox with me. Now Pat, welcome to the show. Thanks for joining me. Marcus, thanks so much for having me, man. Now, you guys all know Pat. Now, Pat is the guy who went from like the guy you've never heard of to the guy who seems to be everywhere on the internet right now, especially if you're in the Ruby world. And Pat's whole thing is he is going to help you learn Ruby and then level up to become a lead and someday as internet famous as he is. Isn't that what we're going to talk about today, Pat? Yeah, that's the gist of it. Cool, cool. Well, if you're joining us live, uh, we're really excited to have you. Um, please use the chat app on the side or the Q&A app, which is enabled to ask questions. And uh, we've got already some questions from the audience, so I'm really psyched to dig in. But Pat, let's just take a step back. Tell us about yourself and how you became, I guess, somebody who would even care to talk about helping other people level up on Ruby. Sure, I think that's a great place to start. Uh, I, so I started learning programming when I was a little kid. I got really lucky I had this teacher. I had a computer class in second grade and I was kind of getting bored in the class and I was always messing around with stuff and like kind of poking around the computer and doing the things I wasn't supposed to. And finally my teacher just gave me the book for the logo manual, okay. the logo manual for book and said, hey, All right, uh, just do this and hang out for the, um, and just hang out for the rest of the year and, and learn how to program and stuff. And so I did, it was really cool. So I, kind of, I love to give her credit every time I get a chance to. Her name is Joan Fletcher from Rhode Island, and I've been trying to get in touch with her for years. So if anybody happens to know Joan Fletcher from Rhode Island, I would be immensely appreciative of you if you could reconnect us. But, uh, so that was really early on, and of course I wasn't you know, really programming at that time. But it kind of set the bug in me, and, uh, and I started just learning more about computers over the years, and like in middle school and high school, I would stay up late and I'm like on the computer in our in our uh, family room, like reading hacking websites and stuff because the Hackers movie would come out and my mom would come in, I would close all the windows real quick because she thought I was looking at porn, but really I'm looking at hacking websites. <laughs> and uh, so this whole time I'm just, I'm learning how to program and it was probably around, it was seventh and eighth grade when I started really getting into it. And I picked up this book, uh, it was about web programming in general. And it was like Perl and CGI and Java and JavaScript. And that kind of really introduced me to the different possibilities in programming and in particular doing web stuff. And I started learning Java and that was kind of my main focus. And I started writing these tutorials for this internet security and hacking website that I was on all the time. And there was just these really huge epic tutorials that took somebody from knowing absolutely nothing to making programs. Uh, in Java. And so that was kind of where I started taking stuff I knew and sharing it with other people. But that wasn't really my focus at the time. I was just learning how to program and it was a, hey look how cool I am, I can help you do this too. And uh, from there I, I started working. Um, I graduated high school and I got a job working at a little contracting company in Grand Junction, Colorado, which my first gig ever was converting a Cold Fusion app to a PHP app, which from a programming standpoint is not that fun, but to be getting paid to code at 18 in Grand Junction where there are no real technical opportunities was just an absolute thrill. And from there, uh, I was working with a friend of mine. He introduced me to Ruby. We started kind of making these little products and stuff and trying to sell them, but couldn't sell them at all. Um, I went on, I made a little poker trainer for myself in Ruby which I then turned into a product online when Rails came out, and that paid my bills and then some for a good eight months, and that was my introduction into this web product world, I guess. Um, but then I didn't do anything with it. I got a job working for San Francisco startups. I did that for a long time. Started going to meetups, teaching people stuff I knew, little things like, here's RSpec, this is cool if you want to do TDD. Here's how you do it, and spending a lot of time on mailing lists, just getting really involved with the community. And over the years, the thing I've found is that I love programming, I love making stuff. I also really like teaching people and just learning together. It's not so much about me teaching people, it's us learning together. And uh, i just kind of been doing that, and then over the past few years, I started doing more consulting and coaching and training, and eventually, I did that 30 by 500 thing that some yep. people are familiar with and yep. 
and did all my research and found out that there's this huge group of people learning Ruby who who want to learn more Ruby, who want to break into the industry, who want to have a career as a Ruby programmer and are ha just having tons and tons of trouble doing it and don't know how to do it, despite the enormous wealth of resources available. There so, is, yeah. There's a lot of stuff out there again. on learning Ruby, right? Today. There's tons. Yeah, there's today tons. tons. Do you find, I'm just curious, so yeah, I mean, I was in 30 by 500, I saw your success from afar and, and you know, was a little jealous because of how amazing it was, but did you find as you went to go find an audience that it was existing developers who wanted to transition skills or was it people who said, you know, programming is cool, maybe I've done a little HTML, but everybody's doing Ruby and I really want to learn it and it's just kicking my butt. Yeah, the, so there is definitely both. There's a lot of people who are programmers using like Java or C Sharp that kind of want to cross over. But the overwhelming majority of Safari data that I got was from people who were looking to break into programming for the first time. And Ruby is the programming language they want to use, either because they hear it's the hot thing, or they know about the community, they heard about Rails, they have a friend doing it, any number of reasons. Um, so for the most part, for at least the at least the Safari data that I gathered and the audience that I'm have been focused on is people who are programming for the first time. But there's definitely a lot of um, there there definitely is a lot of kind of crossover people too. Do you, so we we actually have our first question from the audience. It's live. This is live people working without it. Right. So Come here we go. <laughs> are you ready? Ready. Okay. It's this person, as Jonathan's asking us this, is a deep knowledge of Ruby important currently? Do you think it'll be more important in the future since there are so many Ruby developers from many walks of life? And I'm going to read into this a little bit. I, I bet there's a lot of people who just are able to work at the surface of the language without really going deep into the understanding of the language. And I think this person's asking, is it important to go deep or can you be just as successful maybe without that and just leave that to the computer science people? That's a really good question and I think it's really important to understand for people who do want to have careers as Ruby developers. The more Ruby you know and the more powerful you are with it, the better off you'll be always. And so the kind of classic example for this is people who want to start learning Rails. And they say, how much Ruby do I need to learn before I learn Rails? Or how, how can I learn Rails in parallel with Ruby? And I think you can, but the answer is you probably shouldn't. Because mm. Rails is built entirely on Ruby. And so if you have a deep Ruby understanding, that lets you investigate Rails. And you can learn how every piece of Rails works because it's all written in Ruby. And Ruby is a very interesting language in that it's very malleable and people use it differently. And so the more that you learn about the language and the more ways you learn to use it, the more versatile you'll be in terms of being able to look at any code base, whether it's a Rails code base or a gem or just a basic Ruby project and be able to make sense of it. Um, I also think Ruby's really cool and a lot of fun and there's so much stuff that you can dive into. So I, I definitely say, like, if you're interested in Ruby, go down that rabbit hole, learn as much Ruby as you can, make programs for yourself, and solve problems for yourself, explore the language, because it is a very deep, very rich language, and all the stuff that you're using is built in it, and you're, if you're kind of using all the stuff around it, but you don't have the solid foundation of using Ruby, then you don't have, that, you're not using them very naturally. Like, you can't transition from one to the other very easily. Whereas mm. if you have a deep understanding of Ruby, you can pick something up pretty quickly and make good use of it. Yeah, I remember when I started playing with Ruby, it was really in the context of Rails, and honestly, it was a little bit like casting magic spells. <laughs> Scaffold, app, blah, 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 right? And I was like, well... Uh-oh. I lost you, Marcus. I don't know if you can hear me, but I can't hear you. Um, self out. Okay, pretty quickly what I found was that if you can't go read the source of Rails, I was stuck. I was stuck trusting the magic, and I was constantly scratching my head. So I can't imagine somebody going out and saying, well, I think I'll learn Rails, and if I learn a little Ruby along the way, that's fine. That, that might work in other things, although I suspect not, but, but certainly I didn't have that, any success with that approach when I tried it. 
Yeah, yeah, you're totally right. First of all, there's so much, like, I love that analogy of it's like casting spells. That's exactly what's going on. And that analogy has a long and storied history in, in programming. We have structure of structure and interpretation of computer programs. Sick up, yes. From the MIT, and that's all about casting spells and being a wizard. So I love that. I think that's cool. But yeah, people don't realize just how massive Rails is and how many pieces there are to that puzzle of understanding program flow and understanding frameworks in general and databases and caching and web servers and deployment and HTTP and all this stuff. It's this huge, massive topic where every little subtopic, every node of this kind of thing is its own huge topic. And people dive into it and don't understand the absolute foundation. And it's kind of like, to me, saying you're going to write Rails applications without learning Ruby, without no, having a deep knowledge of Ruby, is like, I'm going to write a book, but I don't want to learn any English. You know, or whatever your language of choice is. Right. right? It's the, it's yeah. the, it, is, it is the language that creates the whole ecosystem. And, and so maybe that's an even better point is you look at just the absolutely vibrant, rich ecosystem there is around Ruby. The Ruby programming language, Rails comes out of Ruby. Madison Ruby, the conference t-shirt that I'm wearing right now, comes out of Ruby. There's so much beautiful stuff around Ruby. Why would you not spend your time, why would you not devote your time to learning the language that has created all of these amazing things? Wow, I, just well said. And okay, we've got another question from the audience, but I want a very short answer if you can on this, Pax. I think it's going to be a challenge. Why <laughs> was I don't Ruby? Get okay, here we go. No, not because you talk too much, but no. Why did Ruby come along and appear so amazing to people? Why did it light up the community in the face of? We have had programming languages for thirty years. I've done COBOL and Fortran. I did Java and Perl and Forth and Pascal and Basic and Assembly. But I see, uh, I have seen for the last ten years an energy around Ruby that, frankly, was a little shocking, and and I really felt like it would be kind of short lived, and I've been wrong. I think there is a short answer to it, and it is the philosophy behind the language, in particular the language designer Yukihiro Matsumoto. I want programmers to be happy. That's what he said. Ruby created so that programmers will be happy, and this is an industry where people really thrive on their technical knowledge and being hardcore. And here you have this, this little Japanese dude saying, I just want you to be happy. And it attracts, and now so it's important to remember, Ruby was around about 10 years before Rails came out. So there's a lot of kind of lead time before it really blew up. But I think just that basic core philosophy of I want people to be happy attracts people who are programmers that want to be happy. And you get DHH making Rails, same thing. I want web programmers to be happy. And there's so much stuff in Rails that is kind of common and, and wide now, but when Rails came out, it was like... Oh, you know, active record is, and amazing. all these things. Amazing. Crazy. Was okay. that short enough? Yes, that was great. And in fact, I have a feeling we could do a whole other show on how the evolution of something like Ruby brought it to where it is, and yet its initial idea of I want people to be happy was so different than an Oracle doing Java or a Microsoft doing .NET and where they are today, where clearly most of the people I meet in those technologies, they're not happy. But, okay, let's, let's cut that well, short. Yeah, but so the important thing about this is that, is that is the one reason why Ruby won't go away. I don't see it going anywhere. It'll evolve. It'll change. But the fact is you have a community of programmers built entirely around the idea of I want programmers to be happy. And that is such an important core value of the Ruby community that people love so deeply that no matter how much the language and community evolves, it's not going to go away because it's just too good to give up. I love it. Pat, thank you very much. I've been talking and going to continue talking with Pat Maddox. He's the author of Ruby Steps, the book that will help you get up to speed and get a job as a Ruby developer. And I know we've got a stream of questions here, and I'm sorry I'm taking up his time. Pat, I want to talk about your new thing, because Ruby Steps has been very successful. My guess is your audience is really engaged with it. But what is this thing you're announcing that you're bringing out called the Ruby Steps Professional Developer Program? So the Ruby Steps Professional Developer Program, or PDP as I'll call it from now on, is all about teaching you how to become a professional developer by working the way that professional developers work. 
And this comes out of a year and a half or two of hardcore <laughs> Safari research and spending a decade working in Ruby professionally and seeing how people work and seeing how people learn. And the thing that I've really noticed through my research and through working with people in Ruby Steps over the last year is that there, there is this wealth of information out there. There's so many ways that you can get involved in programming. But none of them are really actually what professional programmers do. And are they more like exercises you get in college or second grade if you're like you and you're learning Ruby, you know? Uh, they're, they're, they're definitely like the tutorial type, of getting you to create a program that somebody else made. And th like there's things like RubyMonk, which I think is absolutely amazing for developing problem-solving skills and learning the standard library and stuff. There are all these great resources to kind of get your feet wet. The problem is that so many people are doing this and they don't see how to get past that and they get stuck. Okay, I've spent months or even years doing all these things that are the standard path that everybody says, do Code Academy, do, do, Ruby, Cohen, do Ruby Cohen's, do uh, the Prag Prog, um, yeah, I guess that's the Cohen's, right? So do Ruby Mont, all these things, and they, kind of, they get stuck and they're not able to break through to a point where they can actually get a job and start building a career. And... The real problem to, that I see is that they're, you're in this, you're working like an amateur, essentially, that you're, when you try to get a job, people will go, how do I get a job? But you're not competing against amateurs, you're competing against professionals. Mm, yeah, and, that's a great point. And the important point there is that the professionals are not focused on learning the language specifically, they're focused on learning and how to be productive with whatever tool they have and solving whatever problems they face. And so the professionals are learning faster than you are because that's what they're focused on and they have enough context. So while if you're going through the kind of standard approach to learning a programming language, while you are advancing past where you were yesterday and you might even be gaining ground on the other amateurs in your circle, the professionals are distancing themselves from you. And you have no idea. You have no idea because nobody ever told you that you're so far away from being a professional that you completely need to change your thinking. This is, this, is based on, this is based on my research and working on this stuff for a year with people. And so Ruby Steps PDP is my thing saying, all right, if you want to work like a professional, here's how you'll do it. It'll be hard, and it's completely different from everything that everybody's told you, but it works because it's worked for me and it's worked for tons of people that I've worked with throughout my career. That that is amazing. You know, I found. See, I I, I went to I went to college. Got a well, almost. I'm a dropout. Got a, almost got a software engineering degree. Um, and I and I thought I knew how to program. And so then I entered the job market. And my first job was totally different than I thought programming would be. Now I was still sitting in a computer typing and using a language to create things. But I was really lacking this bigger set of skills around. Organize, organizing things, time management, communication, uh, breaking big problems into small ones, estimating. I mean, this is just where I was deficient. Are these the kinds of things that the PDP would help me with? I'm actually really glad you said those things and, and brought them up because that's exactly what I'm focused on. Uh, the two, two kind of really big things are breaking things down into small pieces. I've seen, I think I mentioned, I don't know if I mentioned the Rails competency map, but this idea of there's all these things you have to learn. And I think it's really cool in that it shows people the different pieces of the puzzle. The problem is, is that as soon as somebody says, here's what you need to learn, like the actual content you need to learn to be a Rails developer, it's out of date in a couple weeks. <laughs> like, things, things change. The Ruby, like, by the time we finish this call, there can be 12 new Ruby gems up on Ruby, on um, rubygems.org. Okay, that's probably true, actually. It's, yeah, and so the idea is that the, uh, the available knowledge is expanding at a rate faster than we can actually learn it. And so if you have this fixed path of stuff to learn, then you're always behind because the world, the, just the Ruby programming world is advancing faster than you can ever catch up to it. And so the skill to learn is, is not a particular thing like Ruby or the standard library or testing. The skill that you work on is learning and being able to take problems and break them down to something that you can make visible progress on in a short term. Because that's what professional programmers are doing on a right. daily basis. They take right. these giant, huge pro problems 
they break it down, they make progress on it, they get feedback on it, they deliver something that's valuable, and then they move on to the next thing. So that's, so, the, that's the kind of problem solving part of it, and then communication is a big, huge part too, which we can talk about, but the but problem solving, particularly in a way that professionals do, and communicating and understanding the importance of communicating within a team and an organization really is the core focus of Ruby Steps because those are the core practices of any professional developer. So Ruby Steps, the book, is out there for folks, and they've been using it for a while, and the PDP is your new, is it an add-on to the book? It sounds like it's kind of a leveling up. It's for people who say, I'm, I'm actually serious about making this my craft. And is that true? And how is its delivery different? Is it a book I download or, or buy at Amazon? Yeah, so they're, so they're totally separate things. The, there's two books on rubysteps.com right now, but the kind of main one is Ruby Steps the Playbook. And that is a set of games that you can play. Well, let me back up. So there are a bunch of people that want to write Ruby programs. So they want to write programs, and, and they get stuck. They go through the tutorials, and they then sit down and try to work on their own thing, and they're feeling completely lost, and they've forgotten all the stuff that they've learned, and they can't put anything together. And, of course, what they want to do is make these really, really cool applications. And they want to fill up their GitHub and have something they can point to and they can show their friends and they can show their family and they can go to an interview and say, hey, this is something I've worked on. Let's talk about it. I'll tell you all about the problems I've had. But they can't because they work through the tutorials, they sit down, they stare at their screen and they go, what do I do now? And I'm stuck. I'm and just I'm stuck. stuck. And I'm stuck. So Ruby Steps, the playbook, is a little ebook. It's short, it's actionable, it's effective, it's simple. Actionable, effective, and simple are the things that I love. So I made it exactly like that. And you go through and there are a series of games that you play. Not, not, not program or not computer games, but games in the sense that it has some rules and you play those rules and something interesting happens as a result of it. And there, I think there's 14 or maybe 17 games in there. I can't remember. Uh, that get you programming and help you fill up that GitHub repository and write your own computer programs. No matter what your current skill level is, no matter how much stuff you know, it is a playbook that gets you making progress every single time you sit down. So that's just kind of for the people that, that want to get coding. Um, Ruby Steps PDP is all about taking you from that point to building a career long term in Ruby. And so I make the distinction too between, I hear a lot of people say, how do I get a job? And getting a job is cool, building a career is even cooler. And there's so much stuff that you can do before you get to that point where you actually have your first job that is still building your career. And so that getting a job is one significant milestone in your career. But if you think about it from the very beginning as I'm building a career in Ruby, then it doesn't matter as much whether I get my first programming job now, three months from now, six months from now, or a year from now, or even longer. As long as you're making progress on the career. Yeah, because I, it, it all depends on, well, there's a lot of stuff we'll talk about. You were going to ask something. We've got a question from the audience, uh, and they're starting to stack up. So, okay, here we go. What jobs are out there for Ruby developers outside of Rails or web development? Ah, uh, that is a tough question because as the person asking knows, I'm pretty sure, that the vast majority of Ruby stuff is Rails-specific stuff. Um, and I've talked to some recruiters to see kind of the vibe there, and they say like 90 to 95% of, of Ruby stuff is Rails. So 95. 95% 90, of the 95 stuff is Rails. 95% of the jobs that they place yeah, are Rails, guys. Are, all, are Rails. So... That is a place where people will think, well, I should learn Rails, but yeah, but no, learn Ruby first because then you'll be that much better of a Rails developer. Um, this, my, my simple answer to that question is probably the job that you already have. And I don't care whether you work in programming or whether you work as an intern at an accountant's office or whatever, the, whatever it may be, you do repetitive stuff on a daily basis. And you can create Ruby programs to automate the stuff that you do or even a tiny part of the stuff that you do. So if you have a job right now and you do anything repetitive at all and you want to become a professional Ruby programmer, 
do it right now. Start writing Ruby programs to help your own job. And then when you decide to transition out and you start looking for a real job, you can show people, hey, here's something that I built that solved a business problem. So I know that doesn't answer the question directly and that like, okay, what can I do to go out there and get jobs that are not rail specific? But the, sim the simple, straightforward answer is you have a job right now that you can make at least partially a Ruby programming job, have a lot of fun, and who knows, maybe you never need to switch out because you're getting raises left and right because you're helping out the business, you know, and you're having a good time solving problems you're in a place that you already like working at. I think that's so great. I uh, I used to be the development manager at an enterprise uh, manufacturing company that had a big IT programming staff, and I can't tell you the number of people we hired. And we would say, "How'd you get into programming?" Instead of them saying, "Oh, I went to school for software engineering or computer science," they were like, "Well, I started out by automating Excel, and that got me into VBA, which got me into object-oriented design, which got me into C sharp, which got me into web." Right, and so there's this progression, and they were interested enough to start tinkering. And literally, they were sitting in front of me and were had gone from without any formal education, basically just self-taught. And I knew what I could look at that person, and that person was so valuable because they knew how to dig, they knew how to learn, they knew how to overcome. I mean, if you're talking about somebody who writes Excel macros, you're talking about somebody that beats themselves with a whip on the back for fun, right? Like this is tough stuff. And I just remember thinking. Like when these people would come in my office, I didn't think, wow, you're an idiot because you probably don't know as much about tail recursion as these other graduates. What I thought were, you're a get it done guy who's got a clear track record of proving that you can bring business value through software development. So for me, that was always a big plus. Yeah, I think that's so cool. And, and uh, I, that's a story that you hear over and over from people is they just started doing something and it led to another thing, another thing. And like there's just this little thread that they keep tugging at. You know, they're like, what what if I do this? What if I do this? And before you know it, you're doing some really cool stuff. The thing that is why I think why that progression is so valuable and available in programming is that anytime you do something in programming, anytime you create new functionality, and it could be a simple method that does one little thing you have now increased your own capabilities. And so that lets you try new things. And so you're progressively expanding your capabilities. And then you integrate those. So I kind of talk about capability and capacity. And capability is a new thing that I can do that I couldn't do yesterday. And then when I've been working on that and, and doing that for a while, I integrate it. And so now I've increased my capacity. And that is the just the ridiculously cool thing about programming is I can sit down in five minutes, half an hour, an hour later, whatever it is, I can do something, I Maddox can do something that I couldn't do an hour ago. And now that just, that's leveled me up in a tiny little way, whatever it is, but you just do that repeatedly for years and years and years. And all of a sudden you're, not all of a sudden because it's over years and years, but you do that for years and years and you're doing some ridiculously cool things and you have new opportunities available to you. I think it's that it's mindset like, that I think that people really succeed with. Yeah, it's like you said, and, and let's go back to the word all of a sudden, because you said it, and then you kind of took it back, right? Ruby was around like 10 years before it all of a sudden became popular. Right. Well, it, we almost always choose to look at when something got really big, and we kind of ignore when nobody knew about it. And we say, well, that wasn't really important. But if Ruby had not been laying the groundwork and the framework for making programmers happy in small ways, it never would have achieved the success. So in the same way as whether you're safari and by the way, let's take a second. safari is the concept that 30 by 500 uses for finding out what your audience wants. It has nothing to do with the Safari browser. We do not owe Apple any money for using that term. So anyway, I just wanted to point that out, that doing these little habits will create a day when you look back and say, I'm drastically different than I was. Um, even though it didn't, if it didn't feel like it took that long, I just had to do it a little bit each day. Another question from the audience here. Um, I am really curious, what, how good is the Ruby on Rails, especially the Rails market? I mean, this is where people are working, is web programming. How good is it right now? Like, I know tech programming jobs are out there, but how strong is the Ruby and web market really? So I had a really good conversation with a recruiter the other day. And when I say I'm not like a recruiter that just emailed me, but a recruiter that I've known for about 10 years. And he's the only recruiter in the Ruby world that I trust. 
His name is Brian Mariani. He's from, he has a company called Mirror Development, or Mirror Recruiting, something like that. If you, we'll see if we can get in show notes or something, but Brian Mariani from Mirror Recruiting or something like that. And uh, so I, I got the scoop from him, and he's, it's still super hot. It's kind of as hot as it's ever been, actually, um, which is kind of weird. You think that, that like, Node would have taken over something. Yeah, that, it's kind of crazy. Maybe, been around so long. Yeah, but it's still it's still really good. Um, there's still a huge market and a shortage of developers. And I say shortage of quotes because it's kind of not true. It's just that it's difficult to connect developers with the companies that can actually benefit from them. And part of that is from the explosion of people breaking into it. And so when we hear that a company only wants to hire advanced Rails developers or senior Rails developers, it's kind of true because Rails has been out for 10 years, so why would you not hire people with lots of experience? But two is as soon as they say junior or mid-level, they just get swamped with applications of people that don't make the cut at all for kind of the reasons that I talked about earlier. Um, and so he says that companies are looking for senior Rails developers or people with raw talent. So who's, 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 who's a raw talent? Yeah. And, and that raw talent is just code for can get stuff done the way that we need to. So no, but, you excel VBA programmers. Don't give up hope. You've got a lot of <laughs> Exactly, exactly. Um, so, you know, I don't know the specifics of how much people get paid these days. Like, Brian is the guy to talk to because he places hundreds of programmers, Rails programmers per year. Like, he knows that stuff cold. Uh, I'm sure that he'll be happy to help anybody out. He's always been super available whenever I have questions. But it's a good living, you know. Like, it doesn't matter. It, the salaries will change depending on the city that you live in. Of course, San Francisco pays more than Portland or Denver or whatever, but it's a good living, right? You you feed your family, you live well, you know, and then some typically. Nice. Well, another question from the audience. This actually came in before the show, and I think it's a good question because I think it's something I always like to uh, to sort of look back on. And the person asks, "What things do you know today that you wish you'd known five years ago?" Oh man, this is uh. This is a really good one, because five years ago, I was, I was two weeks away from turning 25, which means I'm two weeks away from turning 30 right now. Well, almost happy birthday. <laughs> Thank you. And I was, like, I was pretty good, but I also did a lot of dumb things uh, in, in my career. So probably the first, the number one thing that I know now that I wish I knew when I was 25 was that the technology doesn't matter nearly as much as I thought it did. And it's kind of weird to say, but it's totally true uh, after having this experience where programmers often like to debate which language is better. Like I see somebody had said Ruby versus Python. <laughs> you know, like, right, that's a very common thing. And which database is better and which, which web framework and which web server and which OS and all this stuff. And it kind of it doesn't really matter, man, because we especially the way that we try to make people feel bad for not knowing things and stuff. It can be really, really harmful. And uh, I spent a lot of my time arguing those things and proving, trying to prove to people how smart I was. And, um, and it just kind of doesn't matter so much because cause now I've been, had a career as a Ruby programmer for 10 years. And what I've really learned is that having longevity in this industry is all about forming relationships and strengthening relationships with people. And so it's just, it's just all about the people. And all the cool, the best opportunities that I've had, the most lucrative opportunities, the most fun opportunities, the most personally satisfying opportunities, those came from somebody saying, hey, Pat, I want to work with you on something. Because they knew me, and they'd worked with me in the past, or they had read some of my stuff, or they got a referral. You know, I've <laughs> I remember one time I went to go pitch a CEO on doing a project for his company. And I walked in the door, we shook hands, I sat down in the chair, and he said, so, I hear you're a Rails god. And I just stopped, I looked at him, I took a deep breath, I'm like, 99% of the sale's done. You know, like, before I even walked in the door, the, the dude was going to hire me because somebody else that he trusted had said, hey, talk to Pat, and apparently... <laughs> said he's a Rails guy. So in geek right. speak, he said, your reputation precedes you. Your reputation precedes you, exactly. And so at that point, it's really less about telling him what I can do and just understanding 
the problems that he's facing, his business is facing, and spending like 90% of my time understanding what their business problem is, and then at the end say, I can help you with that, here's how. Right? And so spending less time trying to sell him on what I can do and more time understanding stuff. And uh, that has, uh, understanding what they need and then seeing if I can fill that need, then tell them how I can do it. So if I could, if I could go back and have a little heart to heart with you know, 25 year old me, I'd say, look, you're pretty good at what you do. You don't need to go around telling everybody how good you are. You just do your work, they'll see it and they'll believe it more. Focus on on other people's problems and identify what you can do for them and that's how you'll have a really good career. Yeah, the, boy, you, you really hit home there to me. Like, Stop worrying about telling people how great you are and just get to work and help them and, and show them um, by what you do. Uh, I think in the end uh, that's, that's really fantastic advice because especially new people I mean, I've seen so many resumes from people in the one to three year of experience range, and the only thing on the resume is acronyms. Acronyms of all the different tools and technologies they own, as the uh, uh, that they know, as though that was going to be the the thing I evaluated them on. Um, and if anything, what it really told me was they had the wrong perception about what was important. They thought that I was just hiring them to type or to be some sort of translator into a language, and. I wanted people that could think, which is crazy, I guess, but uh, you can communicate <laughs> well, a little bit. Yeah, and I think that that is, so that's, that's very, very common, and there's probably a bunch of reasons around that, but part of it is that people, like you said, just don't have the experience to know, and they haven't been at enough places, they haven't worked long enough, and they haven't seen the problems that arise when you don't have good communication when you aren't focused on the problem, on solving an organization's problem specifically, to understand that that is the important part. And so, because it is kind of exciting to differentiate yourself early on as, I know Ruby, I know testing, I know TDD, any one of these things that I know that is kind of a cool thing about me, or I think it's cool, you know, it feels good. But that's not what the business cares about. There's a lot of people out there that can do those things too. Can you communicate effectively? Can you understand the business problem? And can you show up every day and do it and work on that business problem? And that's probably another thing five years ago is if I knew uh, how, how, just how, like, I mean, I, I blew things off that I really shouldn't have, you know, and I, I torched some bridges and I put out the flames on some other bridges before they, before they fully blew up. But uh, if I had spent my time just being really focused on building bridges and, and being focused on helping other people, uh, not, not exclusively, not without helping myself because I need to take care of myself too, but if I focused on helping businesses before, ahead of helping myself, then I would have so many more opportunities that I do now. Um, and, and it's important because we do live, we work in an industry where you can go out and get a job that pays you 20, 30, 40% more every six months or every year and that's exciting but at the same time it means that it's very easy to kind of burn some bridges and then look back and say you know I'm, it's, I'm a little older a little smarter I wish I hadn't done that yeah no and, and you, you hit the nail on the head and, and again we've got audience questions stacking up but uh, um, I am curious and this is my last question for a minute before we get to these um, you mentioned the idea of professionalism of just showing up of just doing the hard work. You talked about your first job being a cold fusion job and I think that's what it was and you were like, it wasn't much fun, right? But you did it and how important, what, let me back up, what do you think are a couple of key traits that professionals in the software development industry exhibit that hobbyists don't? Oh, that's a really, really good question. I think they're well, probably a lot, um, but I think that, that consistency is really important, just being there when you say you will be and being the person that people can rely on to maybe not have the answers all the time, but, but to be in the game with them and say that you're going to show up and you're going to help out however you can. And anybody listening to this who, who's known me for years is probably laughing right now because they're like, hey, consistency is not your strong suit. <laughs> go. I know, and it's something that I've been working on over the last few years, and that it's kind of 
intriguing to me that I think like, okay, I've had some good success here and I had a lot of really cool opportunities. How much better would my success and opportunities be if everybody, that every single person I worked with knew that they could rely on me every single time? And uh, that's something that, you know, it's just a lesson learned from experience. Um, so I, th I think that that is super important. But there's a couple, a couple other things which are, I don't think that novices or amateur programmers think about this stuff at all. And uh, the, first, the first skill, the first trait, is listening. It's super simple. What you, was that? No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> I know, for, for somebody who suggests listening, I sure talk a lot. But, it, but listening is super important because that is the start of a feedback cycle. And when I say listening, I don't mean specifically like processing audio information with your ears. Um, it's really about being observant and understanding, looking at the interactions going on within an organization or interactions with customers, uh, interactions across your team, being very sensitive to the amount of collaboration and communication that is going on all around you. And from that, you're really gathering data. And then, to me, it kind of splits out into two things at that point. And the first, first is subjectivity. Uh, which to me is contextual awareness. So understanding everything that's going on around you or understanding as much as you can about the stuff that's going around you, going on around you, so that you can make decisions based on that. Because what works in one context doesn't necessarily work in another context. And unless you are very aware of your context, you won't necessarily make decisions that are beneficial to you and your team and your organization. Um, so I call that subjectivity or contextual awareness, and then, and that stems directly from listening. You can't have contextual awareness unless you are listening uh, across your team and your organization. Right. And the second part is um, is objectivity, and this is maybe a little different than what people typically think of when we say objectivity. But I mean breaking things down into objectives that we can actually work towards and achieve. So this is the kind of this is the problem solving stuff. This is we have this giant huge problem that we can't possibly do uh, in one go or even in a small series of steps. So we kind of back up from there. Okay, what, what's the one thing I need to do before that happens? And in reality, that's probably still way too big. So you repeat the process until you have this tiny little thing that you can actually do. Because so many of the problems that we're working on, especially in a business or especially like in, in kind of startup businesses or or innovation-based businesses, we can't predict the outcome. And that causes a lot of frustration and confusion and challenges within an organization because we can't control what's going to happen. Like we, we say, I want to build this company up and sell it for a million dollars. You know, but whatever, I'll take Ruby Steps as a perfect example. Right? I could set a goal and say, I want a thousand customers in Ruby Steps uh, and I want them all to get jobs within the next year or two. And that stuff is so far outside of my control that while it's helpful to think about to motivate me, it is not something that I can control or take action on. So I just keep breaking it down as, you know, as I keep talking about until I identify something that I can take control of. So I'm going to put together this course. I'm going to put out the Ruby Steps playbook, which gets people coding. I'm going to do the Ruby Steps 21 day challenge, which is a totally free thing that we do to get people coding. And I'm going to interview people on the Ruby Steps podcast and get great new information for people, uh, inspire them to do cool stuff. And I'm going to do that every single day. I'm going to wake up and I'm going to do something that will, that I can control, so I can produce something, but I don't know what the outcomes of that will be. But in aggregate, over years, I get closer and closer and closer to this goal of, hey, thousands of people have gone through Ruby Steps. And we, we've had thousands of people on the list doing some stuff with Ruby Steps, you know? So, like, that's actually already super cool for me. Um, but, but by continually working at this stuff, I can get to a point where I can say a thousand people have gone and gotten jobs or built careers because of Ruby Steps. And that is, that's not something, I don't know if it'll happen. It's not something I can control, but what I can do is have this objectivity of identifying objectives that build up to it. 
And, and then the final, the final piece of that is just taking action based on those objectives. So I, I sort of think uh, that's the feedback cycle. I see of like listening is where you're gathering data. Subjectivity is making sense of that data in your context and kind of outlining possibilities. And then objectivity where you take those possibilities and you break them down into an actionable step and then finally you take action on it. And what happens is it produces these outcomes that you couldn't have predicted in advance but if you're listening, then you have new information to go ahead and, and repeat this feedback cycle. I love it. Yeah, um, we. I, I would love to. Yeah, so much there we could dive into, and and. Uh, but you know, let's do this. We promised this was going to be an AMA. Let's hit these questions and see if we can knock them out. We got 15 minutes left, and we appreciate everybody's patience. Are you ready? We're going to do a bunch of quick ones. Okay. All right. Let's go. Okay. Here we go. What do you think are the most important tools, skills, or gems to have? in a Ruby developer's repertoire. Go. All right, cool. So uh, first thing is that the technical skills aren't really as important as the social skills, but I've talked about that a lot. So, uh, and the technical skills will vary according to your organization. So where one company might really value TDD, test-driven development, another organization might totally loathe it, you know? Um, so, so some of those specific things are good to learn if you want to learn them and if you want to strengthen your own understanding. But don't think that like learning these specific things will get you a job or make you super qualified for a particular job because you no don't magic know. bullet, huh? There's no, no, no magic. magic bullet. No magic bullet. Um, but the you know simple thing that you can do is get familiar with the Ruby standard library. There's a lot of cool stuff in the Ruby standard library. There's a lot of great functionality, and if you're familiar with it. You can use the language effectively. You can make your own stuff. You can read other people's code. You can understand what's going on there. You can make modifications to it. I see a lot of uh, poorly written code, and it's poorly written because people don't understand the language very well, and they duplicate functionality that already exists, and they do it in a like it's just doesn't work, you know, because the Ruby standard library has been used by like tens of thousands of programmers for a decade or two, you know, in at least various parts of it. So it works. It's very well tested. It's, it's proven. Um, so get familiar with the standard library. Uh, other things, read documentation. You know, I see lots of people, lots and lots and lots of people, when they have a problem, they Google, and they end up in Stack Overflow, and they're reading a bunch of threads on Stack Overflow and copying and pasting code. And it doesn't work, and, but maybe they get something that kind of works, or they even get it to work, but they didn't learn anything. Meanwhile, the answer is in the documentation, but they don't know it and can't see it because they never learned how to read documentation. Mm, so therefore, they're, they're doing magic a different way. They're just stealing from somebody else, but when it comes time to maintain it, and of course we know that maintenance is where 80% of the cost of software is, they're clueless because they didn't write it. Yeah, absolutely. And the, the problem there is that there's so much information and so many of the answers to the questions that you're asking are in the documentation, uh, but it's not obvious because you don't know how to read it. But you never get good at reading documentation unless you do it and you do it actively. Um, that makes sense. See some other things. One is get good at the command line. You know, so much stuff that we, so much of the software that we use is based on the command line, and so it's good to get familiar with it. Um, get competent in Vim is a simple thing. I mean, just being able to open a file, type some stuff, and close the file like is the basics that you need to do. I use Emacs on a daily basis, but Vim is installed in every Unix computer in the world. So, you know, when you're SSH in somewhere and you need to edit a file, like Vim will work every time. <laughs> to learn kind of the basics. Every time. Um, let's see. I think expressing yourself clearly is super important. How important is writing? Learning to write your thoughts or your ideas uh, so that other developers can understand them. Well, I, I, think it, I think it's critical, really, and I don't mean like go out and write blog posts necessarily, although it doesn't hurt, because think of how many opportunities we do have to write. Um, we're writing code, obviously, when we code, but then there's also comments, and there's commits. We leave commit comments or commit messages, um, respond to commit messages, or have a discussion, whether it's via email or via the GitHub interface, and so it's a it's a skill that you are actively doing every single day. You might have dozens of opportunities to do it on a daily basis. And programming is really just about communication. And we're using language. Like, if we had a better way to communicate with other programmers, 
that produced the results that we wanted, other that was better than Ruby or any of the other languages that we use, then we would use it. You know, if I could express something in purely plain English so it made sense to another person and it made sense to a program or to a computer, then we'd be using that. And to an extent, that's what things like Cucumber are. Um, right. But, but not, not, not all the way, right? Not the kind of magical, you know, casting spells kind of thing. Well, so I, I, know think that it, uncle, I think it's very critical. Yeah, Uncle Bob says, I think it was him, that said, uh, you know, the purpose of source code is to communicate with another human being. Yep. The fact that it compiles is sort of an afterthought. And I grew up in an area, era of punch cards and flipping switches on Altairs. And, like, the reality is, is there were a lot of ways you could tell a computer what to do that a human couldn't readily read. So this whole idea of that the language isn't for the person next to you, I mean, I just never really gotten that idea. I guess I've always thought it, it has to be for another human. The, the fact that the machine compiles it is a nice afterthought. Well, if you have that kind of background where, where code was not readable by people at all, then when you see any programming language, when you get to see um, like C, the language, or C++, right, and all the way on to Ruby and, and Python and Smalltalk being old, Readable language, um, even Lisp. If you can make the parentheses dissolve, big then, Lisp fan. Then it it, it 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 is it's very obvious to you how much more effective this is as a communication tool between programmers. And so I think that that kind of goes into my final point of 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 what are some of the important skills and tools. And um, one of them is kind of a really big one, which I learned about. That goes back to another. What would I learned five years ago is understanding the theory of constraints. And the theory of constraints is that in any given system, there's one bottleneck which is responsible for the, the overall throughput of the system. It's restricting or constraining the throughput of the system. And if you improve that bottleneck, then you improve throughput of the system. But now the bottleneck moves somewhere else and you have to identify that bottleneck and fix it. But if you improve something downstream from the bottleneck, then you haven't, you've just created waste because the bottleneck is only allowing so much through anyway and your downstream improvement has more capacity than it's ever going to get until you address that bottleneck. Whereas if you address something earlier in the system than the bottleneck, then you, in, you create risk of overloading that bottleneck and, uh, and breaking the system. And this applies in any system, really, whether it's your application code or a software system overall of like application code versus network throughput versus database throughput, but also social systems like our planning process and uh, being able to plan out stories and deliver them. So we have like our coding and our, our testing and our deployment and our feedback cycle. There's, there's a bottleneck in there somewhere and, and what do we work on? And in particular, our learning system um, what is the bottleneck to your learning, and what is the bottleneck to being able to produce something interesting? And if you can work to identify the bottleneck in any of these systems, you can improve the system overall and keep repeating that over time. So that's why there's like no one thing that you should do or one path that you should take, because everybody has their own unique system of of learning and of going about. Um, of going about building a career and stuff, and the bottleneck changes every time you fix it. So that's a that's a really huge one. If there's kind of one thing you take away, it's go check out the Wikipedia page on theory of constraints and learn it. And I think the classic text on that is Eli Goldratt's The Goal. Is that right? I haven't read The Goal. I've heard a lot about it. Um, you'll have to tell me. No, I, I, it's been around a long time. I highly recommend it. Um, Pat, so you just mentioned a lot of stuff that professional programmers should do, and what you would love to call yourself, for the Pat from five years ago, and tell him on the phone if you could. Yeah. How? Do, who is this new program that you're bringing out going to be right for? Like, who should be thinking this is going to be right for me? So this is specifically for people who want to build a career in Ruby programming and have been struggling with it, uh, struggling to do that so far. So I should probably back up a little and say, like, you, somebody decided they wanted to get into programming for whatever reason. And the first thing is, is that you're getting into programming because you want to make cool stuff and you want to solve problems. Um, if you've heard that programmers, Ruby programmers, make lots of money or you have a friend 
that is doing it and it seems cool or you're just bored with your current job, don't sign up. It's not going to work for you. I can guarantee it because it's, because it's hard and, uh, and it's all about solving problems and communicating with people. Um, if you think that there's kind of one specific thing that you can do that will lead to you getting a job, probably don't do it. You know, don't do Ruby steps um, because that's just not how it works. You know, what, if you've been struggling with actually getting a career, building up a career, you've been kind of going through all the common resources, you've been going to meetup groups, you've been reading all these books and blogs and listening to podcasts and it's still not making sense, and you want to find a path that actually breaks it down for you and helps you learn those critical skills of breaking stuff down on your own, then it might be something that works for you. What because kind of time commitment are people looking at here? Is this like a book? I can buy it and just piddle away my piddle my way through it, or I, what should well, so I there's, expect? There's, there's kind of two. Oh, yeah, you asked how it's delivered earlier. Yeah, yeah. Tell me about that. So it's it's complete. It's community based for the most part, and there's actually so the so the main components of it are there's some video based curriculum, and that is kind of me talking about the process of how you break stuff down, how you develop a learning roadmap how you identify the things that you need to learn, how you turn those things that you need to learn into little sub-things that you need to learn, and then eventually into these objectives that you can work towards and achieve in short 45-minute sessions and eventually reach this goal of being a Ruby programmer and having enough knowledge to work professionally. And so I have two uh, kind of levels of it right now. And so one of them, which is the professional developer program, which is the big thing and the focus, is you get that course content, but you're also involved in our community. And we have a private discussion area where people are asking questions and working on projects and just taking the things that they encounter on a daily basis and talking about them and supporting each other. We're also using that as the, the starting point to work on our own projects together. And specifically, we're doing open source projects that solve business problems. Um, and we're, so we're gearing up to that because it's really a lot to just throw somebody in and do that. So it's yeah. real programming work, not just like exercises or toy problems? Yeah, exactly. Because there's so much stuff out there that is like the exercises, you know, solve this little problem. And th there's some really great ones. Like exorcism.io I think is super, super cool. Uh, it's, they have problems and you solve them and then you have a bunch of people tell you what they think of your problem and how you can improve it and stuff. Um, so there's, you know, there's Ruby Monk, which has lots of little problems that you can solve. And, and I think those are great for, um, for getting feedback from people, for learning how to, solve, how to solve problems and stuff. But it's not real programming work. Like, it's, it's not solving a business problem, and it's not figuring out how do we take a business problem and deliver it in a way that we can accomplish right now and is meaningful to a business. And ultimately, that's what we're trying to do when we're programming for a business. So that's what we do. Like I throw out the 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 you know typical approach, and because I know that it doesn't work for people. It works for some people. It doesn't work for lots of others. That's what I found in my research and in working with people. So this is the best way that I could describe the professional developer program is if you were to work on my team, this is what you do. You know, this is this is it's my organization. You know, and um, and there's lots of really cool stuff down the road that I'm planning on with that because I guess I'll give a little teaser. I, I can't promote this on the page because it's not a reality, but I run an internet business. I do this Safari stuff. I have lots of ideas and a process for making new products happen. I'm gonna need more developers. Where do you think I'm gonna hire those developers? Am I gonna put some ad out on a job board, or am I going to hire the people that I have trained to work the exact way that I think is most effective? Yeah, so that's what we're building up towards. Uh, that's the professional developer program. There's a kind of lower tier of it. It's called Ruby Steps Community. And that is where you get that same course content. And we have a community chat room that people can talk and discuss uh, the stuff that they're working on in real time. And getting inviting people in to do Q&As. You know, some really cool people from the Ruby community doing Q&A sessions. Um, and... Uh, and yeah, it's so that's the that's the kind of lower tier for which is probably you know, somewhere around like ten anywhere from ten to fifteen hours a week would be that community level of doing the course content and actually doing the work.
Uh, that's the whole point of Ruby Steps is you do work, you know. So if another thing is if you want to watch videos and read books and feel smarter as a result of that and then go on about your life, like it's not for you. Um, I've created the content to be very simple, actionable, and effective, as I talked about earlier. And so it's about people that want to work because ultimately, you know, the, what I see is people think that they learn enough and then they're going to go be a programmer and things are going to be easier. And it's not. It really is the difference between playing pickup basketball and playing in college or playing in, in the NBA or something. Like it's professional versus amateur. It's harder when you're doing it for real. So what I try and do is ease people into that as much as I can, but at the same time, um, push them. Because I, had a, I, I wrestled in high school, and our coach won the team championships for like 22 years in a row or something. Like our school was completely dominant. And the reason, a big reason why, was after we would have our matches against another school, they would go home and do whatever they do. After, you know, they worked to build up to this week. They worked all week to build up to the meet. Our coach made us practice after the meet because he didn't care about the week by week matches. He cared about the championship tournament at the end of the year. And he would just push us so hard. And he would say, you're digging the well deeper, you're digging the well deeper, you're digging the well deeper. So that when we got into a match context and it was you know, a second overtime or whatever, we had been there, the other guy hadn't, and we knew it and we had trained in that. And so ultimately that's what I'm working towards with Ruby Steps is I want people to graduate from Ruby Steps Go offer a job. Go look for a job and say, you know what? I don't think this job's actually good enough for me because I do test-driven development. I do pair programming. I do mob programming. I get quick feedback. I can do that. That's what I'm looking for in a job, and you're not up to my standards. Rather than coming out, uh, doing whatever learning they do, coming out of whatever program they do, and finding out that they're not good enough for these companies that you may not want to work for anyway, if they really knew what was available to them. Now, everything you're talking about just sounds like an amazing development program for software engineers really across almost any language. I mean, is this a Ruby-centric thing? Or if I'm a Python guy or a Java guy or something else and I want to learn this, do I, like, is this only for people who intend to stay with Ruby forever? That's kind of tough to say because, so I think a big part of it, yes, does work for other languages. Um, the basic communication stuff, breaking things down. Like the learning roadmap is a huge component of it and developing your own challenges and exercises to advance yourself. And that is a core component of it that is that I think extends beyond Ruby. But I'm really hesitant to say this because I, I'm hesitant to say that it is totally crosses uh, language boundaries because I'm just so absorbed in the Ruby community specifically. I've been working in it for 10 years. I know lots of people. Uh, I, love the, I love the community. I love the philosophy behind it. So Ruby Steps is interesting in that I don't teach you the specifics of Ruby. I don't teach you the syntax um, because there's so much kind of stuff that's out there that already does that. What I do teach you is how to take all those resources available to you and use them in an effective way rather than... Uh, just reading something and then forgetting it the moment you leave. So I think that so Ruby Steps is very philosophically aligned with the Ruby programming language and the Ruby community as a whole. So whether even though it doesn't teach the right now it doesn't teach like specific language mechanics, um, it's possible that just the philosophy of it is so strongly aligned with Ruby that um, that it may not apply as much. But that said, so much of the problem solving stuff does apply and really what it means is that it is laser focused on Ruby um, if you want to do Ruby and kind of learn the Ruby way and be part of this community and do it for a long time, you know, 5, 10, 20 years, you know, I really hope, I suspect I'll be around 10 years from now, um, then Ruby Steps is the thing for you and you can use a lot of it for for other languages, I think, but as we get into more Ruby-specific stuff, and certainly like the group projects, that's all on Ruby, and when we get into TDD-specific lessons and things like that, the examples will be presented in Ruby, and so you need to do some more work to translate it to your language. Um, so it's very much about helping people that want to have careers in Ruby, but there's a lot of it, a lot of it too, that applies. And then the, uh, to other languages. But then the other thing I should say is, it really, I made it super low risk for people. I made it no risk 
Um, I realized that if you try something and you spend money on it and you don't get your money's worth, that really sucks. But you also lose the time that you spent on it. So I have what I call the Ruby Steps best Ruby course ever guarantee, and I'm really proud of it. <laughs> and uh, the way it works is that you're going through Ruby Steps, and if it's not working for you, I don't let people off the hook right away because what I've noticed is people sign up and say like, "Oh, I actually have to do work. This is hard," and then they want to step away from it. Um, so the first part of the guarantee is that I will work with you one on one to help Ruby Steps work for you and to make it work for you. Identify the things that are standing in your way, and show you how, even more than I already have, how to make it work for you. And if we still, if you and I can't get it to work, then I'll give you your money back, of course, because I'm not going to keep your money for something that doesn't work for you. And I will go research all the different courses and education programs that are available to you. And based on my conversations with you, I will find the one that works best for you. So. That's just how confident I am in Ruby Steps being a killer way to learn this stuff and to develop a career. Uh, it's also the way that even for somebody who is like, well, maybe I'll try this for Python, you know, maybe I'll try this for Node.js or something. If you think this approach sounds interesting to you, um, I'm probably, I don't know, maybe I'll track down a Python program for you. Um, yeah, I will. So, because the point is, I'm trying to find something that works better for you. Uh, I think Ruby Steps is that thing. If it's not the thing, then I'm going to help you find it because I don't want you to be out of your money at all, of course. But I also know that it sucks to be out on your time. And if because you signed up for Ruby Steps, it didn't work for you, then I'm going to make that right by finding the thing that does work for you. That sounds like the world's greatest guarantee. That sounds awesome, Pat. Thank you so much. Where can people find you on the web, and where can people find out about the professional development program? So. At first, uh, I'm twitter.com slash patmaddox. Uh, I have a blog, patmaddox.com, which I've been writing for about eight years and stuff. Um, but if people want to find out about Ruby Steps specific things, go to rubysteps.com. It's right down there. Uh, you see our sweet logo that my friend made. And, um, and that's where all the course stuff is. Professional Developer Program is in there. You can't sign up for it directly. Uh, I take applications for it <laughs> for one really simple reason. If you can't be troubled to fill out an application, then you will fail at Ruby Steps. I guarantee it because it's about doing work. So go to rubysteps.com, check out, I have a free course on there called Say Hello to Your New Ruby Programming Job, which takes you all the way from I don't know anything to nailing your first interview and actually getting a job, and it's totally free. Uh, it walks you through all the steps, that entire process. And check out some of the articles on there and the podcast. We've got a really awesome podcast. And once you're in there, you're kind of in the Ruby Step system. You'll see on the courses page, that's where the professional developer program is if you want to read about it. And that's how you get started in Ruby Steps. Lots of awesome free stuff. Uh, and if this sounds interesting to you, you know, go check out the PDP and fill out an application. And I'll check it out. And if I think that you're a good fit, then I'll invite you into the program. Pat, thank you so much. It sounds amazing, and I can just imagine that in the coming years, so many people are going to say, I got started with Ruby Steps, and look how far I've come. Little steps at a time have really made this a career I love. Thank you so much for being with me today, Pat. Marcus, thanks a lot for taking the time. I really appreciate it. Take care.